Games and Comics. Check them out on Facebook and visit their site at MerryMacGames.com. What's up YouTube? Evan from Epic Duel Time here doing a commentary on another duel video for you guys. This week we have uh, Dan L on the left piloting Gravekeepers uh, playing against Kenny on the right who's playing Constellers. So Kenny takes the turn one and activates a fire, fit, uh, fire formation tanky. Searching out uh, Constellar Kaus. Then he proceeds to set two background paths. Um, one of the fears of, of uh, setting up a board too early on, uh, especially if you don't have the pieces to make maybe a first turn Pleiades, uh, is that if you if your board isn't uh, particularly solid, uh, you don't really want to get rid of any of your combo pieces uh, just for the sake of a, a first turn summon. It's, honestly, sometimes it's better to take the damage. Uh, Dan activates a pot of duality on his turn, uh, getting a torrential. He then normal summons his gravekeeper's recruiter. Which was pretty obvious uh, when he searched the torrential that he probably had something like it. He then activates a copy of Necro Valley. He enters his battle phase and atta directly attacks for 1700, bringing Kenny's life down to 63. And he sets the back row and ends. Um, on his turn, Kenny summons uh, Constellar Algeady and special summons the Kaos. Um, and from there, um, Dan responds with Torrential, uh, which is going to be a really strong advantage on his part if Kenny doesn't have a response. Uh, he'll be able to take two monsters and replace his monster with a search. <laughs> and Kenny opts to lance his cows into place. Um, as I mentioned uh, just a minute before, uh, holding your board in line is the most important part and it's going to be a really big function of this format is um, if, if, you, if you thin out your combo pieces too quickly um, or you let them die too quickly, uh, it, you're not gonna, they're not as regenerate, uh, regenerative as they could have been. Um, so Kenny directly attacks for a thousand uh, at Kaus's reduced attack points. Dan then attempts to normal summon another recruiter. It goes through. He sets up a back row. On his own turn, uh, Kenny activate uh, normal summons a fire fist bear. And Dan negates the summon with Solemn Warning, reducing his life to, uh, by 2,000. The Chaos attacks over, dealing 200 more damage. Remember that the Chaos is currently at 1,900 attack and not 1,800 uh, because of that um, Tenki, and the Recruiter is at 17 thanks to the Necro Valley. So, definitely a game of stat boosters. Uh, Kenny then activates Kaos' effect to raise its level by one. He's using dice to mark uh, the level increases.
He passed his turn to Dan. Dan then normal summons Gravekeeper's Assailant and declares an attack, to which Kenny responds with Book of Moon, flipping Assailant down. Um, Dan follows up with two face downs, ending his turn. Another important factor of both of these decks, they're both uh, control decks. Necrovelli controls certain game mechanics, while uh, Kenny can pick either Pleiades or uh, Omega to go into for Xyz monsters. Um, we're noticing already Kenny's having a harder time getting into those Xyz monsters. Um, he's not drawing like, things like Pollux and uh, another Constellar. Uh, he had the LGA to play, and that could have made a very quick um, Pleiades, but the problem there was that um, he really couldn't get into it. So, um, Dan attacks with the, uh, the assailant, um, Kenny forgets that Necroval, uh, is up, so he just has to fiendish chain the Gravekeeper's assailant, um, and on the main phase two, Dan summons the Descendant, um, and that Solemn Warning, bringing Kenny down to 43 to Dan's 48. It's definitely a back and forth, um, between two very back row heavy decks, very control based decks. Um, Constellars, in a way, do have the advantage. Um, they have access to a wider variety of Vixies monsters that just perform stronger. Um, Dan does have access to the Master Key Beetle, but um, that's nowhere near as strong as having a Pleiades or an Omega or a St uh, Star Leech Paladynamo. I mean, they have three amazing light rank fours to, uh, you know, Master Key Beetle, who's strong and can hold Necrovelli in place longer, but that's not as key essential as having, you know, consistently strong monsters that are all archetype based. Um, Din then summons his another Gravekeeper Descendant. It's summoning is successful. But he responds to the summon with um, Compulse, bouncing the Descendant back to the hand. Um, he really wants to keep uh, Descendant off the field as much as possible so that it doesn't use its effect to tribute off the uh, Assailant. Um, Kenny passes on his turn, to which Dan then, uh, on his turn, uses Allure of Darkness to draw two cards. And seeing as his entire deck is basically... Um, Dark, he can banish one. I think he banishes the Commandant, just because he already has Necrodile. He then normal summons another Descendant, the same Descendant that was Compulsed. He activates Descendant's effect to uh, pop one of the blind back rows, um, to which Kenny chains uh, that same back row, which was Forbidden Lance, on Descendant, um, and bringing Descendant's attack total um, far below being able to attack. Um, ending Dan's turn. On Kenny's turn, uh, he's going to activate uh, a reinforcement in the army to get Constellar Pollux. To which he normal summons the Pollux. This is finally where we're going to be able to start seeing where Constellars really do actually make their card advantage come from. Uh, again, the ability to go into consistent rank 4 and rank 5. Um, again, one of the best ranks 5s in the game is um, Volcasaurus. So, they have almost free access to that as well. Um, consistent, easy access to it. Um, Kaos' effect to bump twice per turn himself, any other const you know, any other constellar, um, is really impressive. It, it really is his strong, uh, a, a huge strength on, on behalf of the deck, uh, and really tightens up the deck. If it weren't for cows, I think the deck would have a lot of a harder time getting up Pleiades as efficiently as it does. I, I don't think there'd be an easy way of doing it. But, um, plays like Pollux into, um, Kaos, Algeating into Kaos, um, really does, uh, form a really strong backbone to the deck. Um, it's definitely one of those decks that is overlooked. Uh, people don't necessarily side for it. 
um, they don't prepare uh, particularly well against it, they don't play test against it, and it's decks like this that actually, can, you know, can really push through things like regionals and YCSs and get tops from it, simply based on the fact that people don't know how to play against it, and it is a good deck. Um, so it's one of the things where if you're not siding against it, you're not preparing for it, you're not going to be ready for it. So um, both of uh, Kaus has bumped up to the uh, has bumped up the Polux to uh, uh, level five, and allows Kenny to overlay both monsters into Constellar Pleiades. Pleiades is going to declare direct, uh, an attack, um, to which he's going to chain his own effect. Um, he can use it on either player's turn, uh, it's a quick effect, so you can chain the effect to bounce a monster, or actually any any card. And um, a fiendish chain is chained to it, uh, this is all during attack declaration, so it's a fair game, it negates the effect of the monster um, on resolution and banishes the Pleiades. A resolution of the dimensional prison. From there, Dan normal summons a Gravekeeper's Recruiter. And attacks directly with both monsters. And this is one of the, definitely one of those games where uh, card advantage becomes a, a huge, a huge advantage uh, in terms of uh, keeping a board, holding the board's consistency, and then um, from from there pushing through life points and winning the game. Um, so uh, Kenny scoops game one, and they go to game two. Uh, Kenny has the turn one, so he opens uh, normal summoning, normal summoning uh, Constellar Algeity. Special summoning Kaos, Kaos bumps both monsters up to 5, and he has a first turn Constellar Pleiades. He says 3 back and ends. Dan follows up with uh, activating a Gravekeeper's Commandant, sending it to the graveyard. Getting a Necro Valley from the deck, adding it to hand, and then activating Pot of Duality. Definitely the biggest advantage of using the uh, the Commandant first is getting the copy of uh, Necro Valley out of the deck. Not that that actually helps, because when he goes to Duality, he gets he can see a Wonder Wand and two more Necro Valleys, so now he can see all three of his Necro Valleys. Um, <laughs> that can happen, but. He does, he can get that Wonder Wand. People are wondering, uh, Wonder Wand uh, works really well with Gravekeeper's Recruiter. Recruiter will not miss the timing on its effect. Um, so if you use Recruiter and Wonder Wand, um, you can generate a ton of card advantage really quickly. Um, Dan sets a monster and sets three back row. The advantage here right now is that uh, Kenny's Pleiades is actually going to be a really strong field control. Um, on his own turn, he's going to activate it and bounce the face down monster. I'm not sure why he didn't do that on Dan's end phase, but um, he can then uh, he then try, uh, tries to direct attack. Uh, a dimensional prison's flipped up, but Kenny chains a forbidden lance, resulting in Dan taking 1,700 damage. Dan resets his monster, sets another back row.
He declares a direct attack with the Pleiades. And it's only a Gravekeeper's Assailant. So he attacks through it. Kenny sets one more card to end his turn. Dan follows up with a uh, Gravekeeper's Descendant. And then activates uh, Royal Tribute. Which hurts Kenny because he had, it looks like a Constellar Sombre and something else. Um, in his hands, he had two monsters. From there, uh, Dan declares a, uh, an attack on the Pleiades with uh, Descendant. Descendant obviously being fewer attack points. Um, so then, Kenny responds to the uh, attack declaration with Dimensional Prison, to which Dan chains seven tools of the bandit. It being a counter trap that's going to end that chain um, during the battle step. Um, beginning of battle, uh, Kenny's going to activate safe zone, and that's going to to lock his Pleiades right in, to which Dan's going to chain Forbidden Lance, and where Kenny's going to chain a Fiendish Chain. So this is going to prevent Descendant from attacking. Um, for the rest of the turn, Pleiades will be unaffected by safe zone until safe zone reattaches. During the main phase two, Dan's going to Wonder Wand his uh, Descendant out of the out of game, or into the graveyard, I should say. Keep in mind, when safe zone is equipped to a monster, it can't attack directly. So, um, if it's your monster. So if it's your safe zone on your monster, it can't attack directly. So um, from there, Kenny's going to have a hard time being able to score lots of damage until he gets some new monsters. Um, so Dan sets a monster in a back row, and then on uh, the end phase of the turn, Shadow Imprisoning Mirror is flipped up. Uh, Plays attacks over a Descendant. Uh, he, I'm sure he was thinking it was a spy. Which is a very, very valid uh, assumption. Dan's on his turn, sets a card and a monster. Kenny normal summons a card card D. Now, we have a huge problem here. Dan's responding with Fiendish Chain. Fiendish Chain does not in, uh, impair card card D's effect whatsoever. It does not stop him from activating or resolving. But I don't think either of them know this because Kenny then uses Pleiades effect to bounce the Fiendish Chain and then use Card Card D. That's completely unnecessary. Card Card D can completely activate and resolve under a Fiendish Chain or Skill Drain uh, with no problem whatsoever. Uh, I have a link down in the description below of this video um, and I decided to tackle the issue of effect negation in response to this incident because it does happen again in the same match. Um, and I, I cover the uh, exact rules of effect negation, so please check that video out. Um, if you already know what I just said about the whole card card D Fiendish Chain thing, then you probably don't need to see that video if you already understand how effect negation really works. But for those of you who are, are unfamiliar with it, or didn't really know, or were unsure, please check that video out in the description below. Uh, it, it should help, help be a tool for you uh, to understand it. Um, it can be a little tricky, I guess, but um, it's something that I think is kind of important as common knowledge for Yu-Gi-Oh! players right now. So, um, Kenny uses a Tenki to get a Fire Fist Bear, and then declares an attack with the bear, uh, and turned uh, uh, Pleiades to defense mode. That was unnecessary as well, because uh, Zavestone would have prevented Pleiades from being destroyed by uh, Mirror Force. Um, so only the bear would have died no matter what, uh, turning him to defense mode really didn't do much, maybe, I, I don't know what reasoning you'd need, but, uh, yeah, the, it doesn't need to go to defense mode, uh, with the safe zone, I guess, better safe than sorry, but there's no other reason for it. Kenny normal summons uh, Constellar Pollux. Um, remember that Pollux's summon uh, starts the condition of being able to summon another Constellar. It is not a negatable effect whatsoever. Um, so you can't negate that. Um, 
So, but what Dan is doing is he's fiendish chaining it to keep it from attacking. <laughs> so when he entered the battle phase, he fiendish chains it to keep it from attacking, not to try to negate its effect or anything. But you can't, you can't fiendish chain uh, Pollux into not being able to have its effect anymore. Dan then uh, uses Malefic Stardust Dragon, banishing a Stardust from the extra deck, um, because he has Necro Valley up. But Kenny has the bottomless trap hole for it. So, both Malefic and regular Stardust Dragon will be banished. Kenny right now has a really strong lock. The only thing that's really hurting him is uh, his own safe zone. Uh, Kenny then tries to su uh, normal summons another card cardy. Dan tries to fiend it. Again, guys, this isn't how card cardy works, and it's not how fiendish chain works. Uh, these cards don't negate. Uh, card car when he tries to activate and resolve he can completely activate and resolve underneath a fiendish chain or a skull chain without any issue um, there's no reason to be trying to fiendish chain or, or even save it so uh, both players seem to have some sort of misinformation on, on that that's absolutely not how um, these cards work what I'm wondering is um, why Kenny hasn't uh, or uh, Xyz changed his uh, Pleiades into M7. Uh, you can do that. And um, in this position, I, I'd consider it. Um, you can bounce or return any card from the grave into the hand. That seems pretty strong. It seems pretty good. Um, so I don't know why he hasn't pushed into an M7. That, that is a bit confusing to me. He normal summons a Thunder King and overlays it with Pollux. Um, I mean, that Pleiades is floating. That's That was just my, my main concern is we already have two wasted fiendish chains um they're not even doing anything they're just sitting out there so why not you know take advantage of them so um but kenny makes constellar omega he then activates mystical space typhoon targeting uh, a face down compulse the compulse is chained targeting omega omega activates its effect and is negated by an effect failure Whew. Quite, a, quite an exchange there, um, but it results in Omega being uh, end up back in the extra deck. Again, that could have ended differently if it was baited by, as I said, M7. Um, you can Xyz change any Constellar Xyz into an M7. You just can't use its effect same turn, so I feel like an M7 is better than this dead Pleiades that's just chilling in defense mode. Um, so on Dan's turn, he uses Gravekeeper's uh, Steely. re-adding a commandant and a descendant. Yes, people, that is how you pronounce the card's name. It's Steely. Gravekeeper Steely. I think thus far, despite despite some of these little mishaps with you know, effect negation and stuff, this is still uh, an excellent match of, uh, of how to see these two decks in action. I would just I would have liked those Phoenix chains to have been used properly uh, and to have not seen cards be wasted on on Phoenix chains that don't really apply to the situation. Uh, Dan normal summons a Gravekeeper's Commandant in attack mode and ends his turn. Um, from there, Kenny ends his turn. I'm not sure why Kenny didn't want to attack with the Pleiades. Uh, it's not like he can be targeted by anything, and it could have attacked over the 2100 uh, attack, and uh, Forbidden Lance at this point can't be used on a monster that's in the under safe zone because Forbidden Lance targets. So, uh, I, again, I'm a little confused as to some of these plays. Um, it just seems like that Pleiades can be used for a lot more than just a wall. Uh, waiting for Save Zone to die. Uh, remember, if Save Zone is destroyed, uh, it brings Pleiades down with it. But at the same time, Pleiades can still attack, it just can't attack directly. So it could, it, that Commandant is only at uh, 2100. Um, I'm not even sure why it was normal summoned. Um, Dan, on his turn, uses Rite of Spirit, uh, bringing back. Gravekeeper's Assailant, and he normal summons his Gravekeeper's Descendant. 
Uh, remember that none of these monsters can use their effects. Uh, they're all under uh, Shadow Imprisoning Mirror. So Dan overlays the Descendant and the Assailant into a Diamond Direwolf. Um, and he wants to destroy the safe zone. And um, that obviously kills the Pleiades. And during the battle phase, uh, this allows 2100 damage to be pushed in um, from the Commandant. Bringing Kenny's life down to 59, uh, closing the gap between Dan and Kenny's life. The problem that we have here is that Kenny is uh, al almost, or if, yeah, he is at a full hand. Uh, and you can see he's got a Polix in hand, and Dan's on his last hand card. So we're going to see right here how card advantage um, is going to play out if a card can last long enough to win, to you know, to win someone a match. So Kenny has Dark Hole for the Commandant, uh, and he's going to set a background end. What he's waiting for is he's waiting for just a one monster to be able to, to summon with Polux. He wants them to go out as a pair together, and that's that's a strong way of doing it. Um, Dan normal summons a Gravekeeper's Recruiter. Um, he attacks and deals 1700. Remember that even a Recruiter at this point won't get its effect because uh, Shadow Imprisoning Mirror does stop effects that activate Engrave. So it's really just uh, a floating 1700 point attack monster. Um, Dan tries to attack again, um, and a Mirror Force takes down that Recruiter. So now we're going to see that push. Um, Kenny's going to normal summon Constella Algeti, and it's gonna, he's going to use her, her effect to summon um, Pollux from the hand, and the two are going to overlay and create uh, Constellar Omega. Um, a direct attack from Omega will bring uh, Dan down to 29. Omega is a hard card to get off the field in macro heavy decks. It's a hard card to kill. Uh, if you think Pleiades is annoying, a card like Omega is a rock. Um, and from here, Dan's going to get uh, play a Pot of Duality, revealing Wonder Wand, another Necro Valley, and a Commandant. Um, so again, he's he's still getting these cards that he just doesn't quite need. Um, if it weren't for those back rows, I'd say, you know, a Great Keeper's Monster and a Wonder Wand could maybe get over it uh, with all the boosts, but... I feel like we, if Kenny's going to lock himself into his back row, he, he's going to be committing to a card that he can at least be comfortable locking himself into. So Kenny on his turn is going to use an MST on the Necker Valley, and um, an attack from Omega is going to kill uh, the Gravekeeper's Commandant. Dan has a new Necker Valley and sets a monster. Kenny's then going to attack uh, with Omega again. Killing a Gravekeeper's Descendant. Dan, on his uh, turn, top decks the Gravekeeper Steely and gets a Recruiter and a Gravekeeper's Assailant. It's just going to be basically creating walls until he has some sort of, of workable out. And the problem is that Dan's not going to likely draw a workable out because um, that Omega is going to make itself immune from spells and traps. And Kenny's going to continue grinding with back row. This is definitely one of those resource battles where Kenny's clearly ahead, um, and Dan's not drawing the cards he needs because his cards don't have the proper synergy that Constellers do. And here's even the bigger kick. Kenny summons a Polux, uh, he attacks, and then a Mirror Force goes to kill them both, but Omega can save both of them together. Um, now, when Omega attacked, um, it, it slams into the spy, but remember, Omega's actually a beast warrior, so it's getting that little boost from Tanky. He doesn't lose a single point of life. Um, you know, not even like the 100th that big a deal, but the fact is, Omega's 25 right now. He's pretty big. Um, Actually, there might be a bit of a correction on that. Um, it's not done in the life, um, but I'll I'll just say it uh, as a as a correction. Uh, when I said that the tanky is going to 
bump up the Omega. It generally would, but um, he did just save them with um, Omega's effect. And Omega applies to spells and traps, so actually he'd be back down to 24. He should have taken 100 on that. But it doesn't really affect the outcome of the duel, um, because Kenny's just going to summon a Volcasaurus, and that's going to push through all of, uh, of Dan's cards. So Dan scoops and we go game 3. On Dan's first turn, he uh, normal summons Gravekeeper's Recruiter, uses a Wonder Wand uh, to draw two cards, and then he gets a search for the Recruiter. He searches a Commandant, and uses the Commandant to search Necro Valley. Uh, he goes through a lot of cards on that first turn, and that's going to provide good thinning and consistency, and overall help him set up his win condition. The biggest problem that we're going to face right here Dan's win condition, his his deck's lock, his deck's goal, doesn't really impede on Kenny's, but Kenny's impedes on Dan's. Um, and so Dan sets four back row and throws up a uh, Malefic Stardust. So we're going to see uh, how Kenny can grind through two back, four back row, Necro Valley, and Malefic Stardust Dragon. Kenny just sets five of his back row. Dan declares that he's entering his battle phase. From here, we're going to see how, you know, how good these players can, you know, use up resources, bait resources, and work with them. So, uh, a, a direct attack is declared with Malefic Stardust Dragon, um, and fe it's Fiendish Chained. Dan ends the turn. On Kenny's turn, he uses Reinforcement of the Army to get a uh, Constellar Pollux. the ends again he's he, he's just gonna hold that that, that malefic stardust in place because he doesn't need to make any sort of a push um, not until he's got the proper cards he needs and if the only monster he has in hand is Pollux he doesn't not really in a dire emergency Dan normal summons um, gravekeepers assailant and Kenny responds with the torrential tribute and that's going to blow up um, all of Dan's monsters and remove that fiendish chain off the board because uh, Malefic Stardust is destroyed. Dan uh, resets up his back row to five, to Kenny's three, but Kenny sets a back row to put him at four. Uh, he normal summons Constellar Pollux. It's fiendish chained. An MST to the fiendish chain, a second fiendish chain. So Kenny sets his uh, final card in hand and ends on four back row to dance three face downs with his Fiendish Chain and Necro Valley. On Kenny's turn, he normal summons Honest. Uh, Honest is still a light level four monster, so it still has amazing synergy. He overlays the two monsters into Constellar Omega. Again, when you're grinding through back row, Omega is going to be able to do it very, very well. And what we're going to see in the next minute is that Dan's really going to have a really hard time outing to it. Uh, Kenny's going to attack, it gets Mirror Forced, he's going to save it, a Compulse, a Lance, uh, and Dan doesn't believe that he can get he can continue playing against that monster, uh, so he scoops very early. So the last video's pack giveaway winner was Ethan Toombs. If you want to have your chance to win a pack of Number Hunters and an Epic Dual Time Deck Box Decal, there are three simple things you got to do. Like this video, subscribe to the channel, and comment with an answer to our question of the week. With many of the Astral Pack 3 spoilers already having uh, been shown, what were you looking forward to most? Uh, and what are you most excited about that's been released? And if not, um, what would you like to hope for uh, is a release in Astral Pack 4? 
As always, like, comment, subscribe, and keep doing America.